for the bill. Okay, make sure everything's okay. Okay, the bell rings and the guy is checking me. Uh, I make sure everything's okay. Okay, uh, welcome to the class. Uh, this is a pos positive psychology class. Uh, this class will be te taught by me, uh, Kai Ping Pong, uh, in Chinese, Pong Kai Ping. Uh, for those international audience online, if you don't know how to pronounce my name, just remember how to play ping pong. So easy to remember. Uh, another professor of this class is uh, Dr. Zhao Yukun. Uh, he's here. Uh, he will be teaching the rest of the class. So I will start with an introduction, very brief introduction. We'll focus on three topics, three questions tonight. First. Why should we care about the positive psychology? What's the big deal about the positive psychology? So the reasons, the meanings, the purpose, the goal, and definition of a positive psychology, what is it? So that's the first question. The second, second question is the theoretical foundation of a positive psychology. Why is it interesting? Why it has a tremendous impact to the psychological community and also to the society in general? So what has been done, and I will share you some of the interesting discovery just to invite you, attract you to this class. Uh, you couldn't will finish here with the detail. I will give you a brief overview. Uh, maybe because this is a lecture, so we'll give you a little bit of tip and suggestion how to make your life worth living, how to make yourself happy. So three questions, that will be the focus of tonight. Before I start the class, I would like to light up the atmosphere a little bit, have a little bit of fun. So first, I want you to pick up your cell phone. I, I assume you all have a cell phone, right? Turn on the camera. There's a camera function, right? Take a snapshot of your face. Don't ask me why. Just one snapshot. Okay, don't beautify it. No need to do that. It's just for the classroom. So a snapshot of your face. What the face can tell you and tell us or will tell you why. Uh, this is uh, exercise number one before the class. Exercise number two, I want you to think very hard. A person who you consider to be your saver or helper or someone who helped you when you need the help and that person push you and probably pull you up. Whatever the action the person take that will make yourself a person who you are right now. Who is this person? What the person has done to you that make you different from before. If you want to say thank you, you will, if you want to express your gratitude to that person, what you want to say, you don't need to say it. You just think what you want to say. That's called the gratification. Many people think, no gratification, just give me your money, right, in return. <laughs> That's a totally different the practice. So the journey of your mind is very different if you just want to feel the gratification, the urge to express the gratitude, versus you have to return other people the favor. That's a totally different result. In Chinese, it's called gaiyan. The second is called baoen. The two very different psychological process. Experience that. Think about that. Exercise number three, I want you to do it before the class, is to recall experience you have or you had recently that you are very much enjoying what you're doing. You immerse yourself in what you're doing. Forgot the time, forgot the space, forgot the who you are at the moment. You really like it. You're really into it. You're in the zoom, on fire, whatever the expression you may want to think about it. It's a very happy and just record experience what you're doing at the moment. And that's the experience we call flow. So what is a flow? 
or why is it relevant to positive psychology? What is important to our human well-being? So those are the exercises. I want you to think about it, to do it you know, from time to time. We only have one hour. We don't have a break. But you can think about it right now. Do you have the experience before? And also, who you want to express your gratitude and who the person you really feel the need to express your gratitude and also took your snapshot. I hope you already did it. So, those are the exercises we just completed before the class. So, we'll come back to the first questions. Why positive psychology? What's the big deal about it? Why should we care? Well, the reason we care is because we need it. The reason we need it because we encounter all the problems in daily life. That the problems may be associated related to your health, like physical health, psychological health. You feel depressed. You feel anxious. I know many students feel anxious about the exams. You may feel jealous, right? Because your classmates just get a 100 point in whatever the exams you just took. You only get a 60 point because the professor was very generous and pushed you over the 60 points. So you feel a little bit jealous. You feel a little bit dumb, right? You only got the six points. So we have all kinds of reactions, and we have all kinds of very anxious, distressful situations. Maybe some problem with your family and friends because this COVID-19 is going on, the pandemic is going on, people's life change in a fundamental way. You have to wear masks in the classrooms. You have to keep a distance from your relative, from your friends. And we sometimes even have to close schools today. I was told that the two elementary schools were closed. All students sent it to some places unknown, right? So we all have this kind of a problem. We have a problem with our career, uh, with our future, and some problem with our society, right? Communities, our schools, and also our countries facing incredible challenges these days. Global, you know, conflicts going on right now, right? All these problems actually make our humans have to react to it. One of the typical reactions we all have is an emotional response, right? We don't just to think. We sometimes we have this uh, physiological, psychological, emotional responses like a fear, anger, suspicious, right? Someone's doing something bad to you. Or depressions, you know, the increase in depression rate in China among college students, even among elementary school students, we did a survey last year. We find that lots of kids now have these uh, depressions. Unheard of for before, even like a nine years old kid said, I feel depressed. I was surprised, you know, what you depressed for. But they all have their own reasons. Of course, we can see the other side of human emotions. Courageous, why right? our nurses, our doctors are doing very courageous things in facing, fighting this pandemic. Pride, right? Tsinghua University students are very proud. These days we rank number 10 in the world. Everybody feel very happy. I doubt about the results, but I think at least we make more, all of us all very proud, right? We can boast that the ranking. And happiness, right? We do have a sweet love. We have a close friends. We feel sense of happiness, elevations, etc. So, we all have kind of a psychological, physiological reactions to all kind of problems. So we need certain level of understanding why we have the problems, how to solve the problems. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't worry about that because we human are actually well prepared to face the challenge, to face the problem, to face disasters. Because during the long process of human evolution, we our ancestors had encountered those problems, those challenges, those disasters, multiple times, many, many times, uncountable. We cannot count how many times. So we are really built up certain psychological and physiological response mechanisms to deal with those problems. Those mechanisms, now we know, is called the HPA axis of stress response. Because all those problems, all those dangers, actually generate stress, then we humans already have something in our body that can help us to fight. And that is actually the three important body parts in our bodies. One is the uh, hypothalamus, 
The second is a pterygoid gland. It's a very small gland inside our brain. And the adrenal gland, everybody know adrenal gland, right? When you are before the exams and you have this adrenal gland release those hormones. So all those are three important axes of the stress responses. They release stress hormones. So what is the purpose of, what are the purpose of those hormones? Actually enhance your sensory systems. So you hear much clearer, you see much clearer that pre pre prepare you to deal with the problems. Cardiovascular responses are much, much stronger. And so also the heart rate pumping, you know, pump your heart, the faster heart beat. More powerful blood circulation that enhance your body and your muscle strength. All these responses prepare you either fight or flight. If you can fight, if you can win, you fight. If you cannot win, you just fight. When you see a beast like a tigers or lions or all the dangerous animals, if you can think you can fight because the animal is small, you can handle it, then you fight. If this animal is so vicious, is so powerful, is so strong, you just get away, you flight, right? Those are the actions or answers took. And after you have done those two things, one of them, or either one of them, then you return to normal state, normal situation, you relax, all the stress relieved. So that's the so-called natural stress response, natural coping strategies that we humans already develop. You already have that mechanisms. That's a very powerful mechanism that made us survive. However, some people, for some reasons, they don't take this uh, naturally adaptive response mechanisms. They engage in doing some, what we call, wrong pool coping strategies. We psychologists have discovered some people don't act, don't fight or flight. They, they don't do anything. They just think, overanalyzing all the problems. If something happens, it's bad. They think over and over. And Professor Dan Gilbert, who is a psychologist from Harvard, as he did study, give 200 some people a BB, you know, I think it's a, it's a BB phone, right? It's a BB phone. And ask those people, report, when you feel distressed, when you feel unhappy, unpleasant, tell us what you are doing. How are you going to solve the problems? He was so surprised. 46% of people actually don't do anything. Instead, they think, they analyze. They think there may be some conspiracy. There may be somebody out there try to hurt me. So they try to develop certain reasons to deal with the problems. And those thinkings we find cannot solve the problem. It just makes the problem even worse. Because if you think that someone out there try to hurt you, if you think there is a powerful conspiracy going on, there isn't anything you can do about it, right? Because it's a conspiracy, what you can do. So that actually made the situation worse. So Greek philosopher Epictetus actually made this very interesting comment. I, I, I encourage you to remember that. What upsets people most is not the things themselves, but the judgments about the things. Uh, that's my translation, it's not ideal. Uh, some people actually translate more poetic, like uh, what's upset the people most is the story they made up. I think that probably is more poetic, but I said it's a judgment, people try to analyze. That's one mistaken strategy people use. Second strategy is doing nothing, idling, right? Just like when things happen, when you feel bad, you're lying bad hiding in your room, and your friends try to get you out of the room, you don't want to, you just stay there, you slap over, and pretty much don't, don't do anything. Uh, we find that that's problematic, because the problem is still there. If you don't do anything to solve the problem, the, the, the problem will haunt you again. Some people rely on some addictive chemicals or addictive behaviors, like uh, marijuana, cocaine, all kinds of drugs, and try to force the person to forget about the whole damn thing. But the sense is still there. Some people rely on some addictive behaviors, like a drinking, smoking, walking. You know, some people rely on walk to release stress. And this is called a workaholic. You know, working hard is actually a problem. It's actually 
That's why I encourage all the professors don't work too hard because they pay probably they're hiding something from something, right? Students should study very hard. I remember, I know some of the students who were dumped by boyfriend, girlfriends. Then what are they going to do? They stay in library, in the classroom for the whole night, study. Actually, they didn't learn anything. They just killed the time, right? Forcing, faking their study. Actually, they're crying and studying, and there's no use of uh, when you're crying to study, right? There's some people try to suppress all kinds of uh, psychological, emotional responses. We find that, that it won't help you because uh, you only made the situation worse. And some people rely on even more extreme actions like uh, hurting themselves or hurt other people. So those are what we call the poor coping strategies. So are the better way to deal with the problems? So we psychologists find perhaps by suppressing, by controlling, by managing all those physiological, psychological negative responses may not help people very much because there's a phenomena called the white bear effect. This effect was first actually reported by Russian writer Tostoyevsky. He wrote this very famous book. It's called the Winter Notes on Summer Impression, published in 1863. So you guys already know this guy, right? He wrote uh, uh, Kalamazoo Brother and also Quine and the Punishment, very famous Russian writers. So in this note, he report this very interesting observations. Try to pose for yourself this task. We can all do that. Let's do this together, together because Professor Daniel Wagner actually asked his, his students to do the experiments in the classrooms. We can do that right now. Everybody try to do that. Relax yourself, you know, close your eye. Everybody try to do that. Sitting on your chair, close your eye, and uh, imagine, and s imagine a white bear in your brain, in your head. Can you think about it, everybody? Think, think hard. A white bear, a polar bear in your head. If you cannot do that, I strongly encourage you to do an fMRI scan. You may have a brain problems, right? Everybody should be able to do that, okay? After you have done that, then try to do the second thing. Try to forget this polar bear. Tosoyevsky finds that, uh, you know, not to think of a polar bear, and you will see that the curse, the thing, will come to mind every minute. So the more you try to forget about that, the more, the stronger the bear will appear in your head. So that's called the white bear effect, or called the also known as a rebound effect. So whoever who try to suppress, try to control, try to forget, try to manage what they call the negative experience, that experience, the symptom of the experience will come back even stronger. So that's called the rebound. This is called the white bear phenomenon. So this is a very interesting experiment because somehow made us psychologists wonder what is the best way to help people to overcome the negative experience they may have, the negative psychological experience they may have. So is there any way we can forget the white bear? Anybody successfully forgot the white bear? Raise your hand in the classroom, anybody? Anybody? Can you do that? Nobody? Or oh, you're good Tsinghua students. You couldn't think otherwise, right? Just try to forget this white bear. There's a way. So what is the other way? Actually, the better way is to shift attention, shift your imagination. Replace the white bear with something else. If you don't think of the white bear, you think of a smiling children's face, right? Or sunshine, or flower, whatever. You know, you think about the other things the white bear is actually disappeared right there. So they give us uh, some suggestion. Perhaps the better way we can deal with uh, anxieties, depress, distress in our daily life is not necessarily by control, by manage, and by forgot. It's actually probably by replacing or even transcend the negative experience with more positive experience. That's the logic 
behind positive psychology. So positive psychology was a new domain in the field of psychology, actually proposed, suggested by Professor Martin Selgman from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Zhao Yukun happened to be Martin's student in China, and he would teach this class uh, with me as well. So Martin Selgman, as the president of American Psychological Association, in 1999, he made this very famous speech, now classical speech, talk about the definition of a positive psychology, the mission of a positive psychology, the characteristics of a positive psychology. He believed that the positive psychology is trying to use rigorous scientific methodology. So one principle of positive psychology is to be very scientific, very rigorous. We need the evidence, we need the arguments, we need the debate, we need the falsifications. So basically, everything positive psychology try to teach, try to propose, try to suggest, requires certain challenge and criticisms. We work on your criticisms. So that's called the scientific methodology. Also, it's the practice and the science as well. So it's not just the practice, like uh, helping people alone, but also trying to find the scientific foundation of a positive psychology, scientific principle of a positive psychology. So try to do all those things to increase individuals' well-being, increase in families, organizations, societies, thrive, and the positive and the happiness as well. So you can see the positive psychology, the whole purpose is to try to use scientific method to find the inner strength of individuals to promote well-being and happiness in society, in family, in individual organization as well. So it's a very broad, ambitious uh, visions of positive psychology. Why? Why positive psychology can accomplish those purposes, those goals? And what is the rationale? What is the evidence behind that? Professor Barbara Fridgerson, who was the last president of International Positive Psychology Association, who also did a postdoc in Berkeley with us uh, many, many years ago, and she is now the president, uh, she's now the professor of psychology, and uh, I think it's at the University of South Carolina, yes. right? Okay, good. Uh, in uh, 2004, she published a groundbreaking theoretical paper, reviewed multiple studies conducted by herself, her colleagues, and the many positive psychologists, proposed these uh, explanations why positive emotions, why feeling good, may be beneficial to individual well-beings. And that theory she proposed is called the broaden and the build theory. Why is it broaden? Because uh, she argued that uh, this positive experience that people have can actually have the power to broaden your resource you may have, whatever this resource you have. You can increase it, you can enhance it. So it's called, it's called broaden. You can build the resource, meaning that there's something you don't have it can help you to build your resource. For example, she argued that if you feel positive, if you're good, elevated, and actually it increase your physical resource, physical strength, resource meaning your physical strength, right? When you feel good, you like to exercise, you like to run, you like to jump. When you heard the good news, you've been accepted by Tsinghua University, you almost feel the power, the energy, the strength, the jump, right? You are very happy. That's called the physical resource increased by your positive experience, positive psychological reactions. You can increase your social resource. What is a social resource? Your network, your social relationship, your friendship, your team spirit, your teamwork, right? Because when you feel good, you like to build social relationship. You like to talk to people. You like to come to this class, right? I don't know that all the people who show up in this classroom is actually a very positive people because you feel good, you so come here. Those people are afraid of English teaching, they stay away, right? Those people who are lazy, they stay in bed. You guys uh, force yourself in this uh, almost a cold winter night, you come to this classroom because you feel very positive. So it increases your social resource. You can also increase your mental resource, you know, your resilience, your self-control, 
your pursuit of a goal or purposes because uh, when you feel good, you actually can handle all the criticism or stress. If you are happy, someone make fun of you, you just left over, you just forget about that. It, does, you know, it doesn't matter very much. But if you feel unhappy, if you feel sad, some people criticize you, you instantly feel being insulted. You're very angry, right? You can see the self-control is very much deter determined by your emotional states. Your intellectual resource, this is something I know Tsinghua students really cherish, really care about it, is the ability to solve problems, to be more creative, to be imaginative. If you really want to have that kind of a resource, feel good is very important. So that's why researchers have found that those Nobel laureates, when they made this great breakthrough in scientific discovery, often at a state of happiness, will feel very good. And the stress, anxiety, actually won't make people be creative and solve problems. So she finds that uh, all this uh, positive uh, emotional states can increase, can build the mental functions of individuals. So that's called the broaden and the build series. Some people might say, I don't care about those resources. I just want to get more money. If the purpose is to get the money in your life, you may, be, you may be surprised to know that a positive psychological state can actually help you to get more money. Yes, yes we all like that, right? <laughs> so in 2006, Professor Edmund Fels, Edmund Fels won Nobel Prize in economics, and he wrote this book, and that was the reason why he won the prize, because of his work on this phenomenon called the mass flourishing. So what is a mass flourishing? It's actually the state that the people feel good, feel wonderful, feel meaningful, and they really want to do something about their life. And he finds that that kind of a mental state flourishing. It's not just individual, but a family, society, organization, company, everybody fulfilled that, that there was some non-material motives. What is a non-material motive? Pursue for your self-respect, pursue for your happiness, pursue for the well-being of the society or other people. Those non-material motives actually lead to more innovation and the economical growth. And this is uh, written by uh, economics. The person actually finds that, that it's not the pursuit of wealth, pursuit of money, can make you to make more money is actually pursuit of a non-monetary purpose can actually make more money than, peop, uh, than, the, uh, than otherwise. Very interesting findings. That's actually consistent with the Chinese century-old wisdom called the He Qi Shen Cai, meaning harmony makes more money. It's not a competition. It's not a fight. It's not a game playing. It's all this. Uh, those business economic people talk about it, actually that's not the reason. The true reason is you make other people happy, you make people make other people satisfied, then you will make more money. So the whole game of the wealth is actually very simple. Make other people content, you will make more money. Very easy, very simple. But we often forgot this is century old Chinese wisdom. We only believe that uh, all the money coming from your rational calculation, your game plan, your all kind of uh, competition or even fighting, that's actually wrong. The fighting is not the secret of wealth. The fighting is the only secret make other people unhappy and make yourself unhappy. So that's a very interesting result. Maybe some of you are really, uh, I don't know, coming from wealthy family, a uh, second generation of uh, big, um, you know, I don't know, I don't want to criticize those people who have a lot of money. But anyway, from the big family with a lot of money, you don't care about the money, right? But you do care one thing, right? You don't want to die young, right? So we find that if you really want to have more money, actually, that the healthy life is very important. Now we have to come to my teacher, uh, Professor Christopher Peterson. In 1990, to 1992, three years I was a PhD student at the Michigan. Uh, I worked as a TA, teaching assistant, 
uh, like Sarah, I, the, my assistant. So I was a teaching assistant for pers Professor Christopher Peterson. At that time, he was teaching personality psychology and the gene analysis. I really liked the gene analysis, so I didn't know what is it, so I took it. I regret about that because uh, first thing he wanted all the TA to do is to reveal what kind of dream you had last life. Uh, that we will all my secrets, so I feel very embarrassed at that time. But uh, he was my teacher, so I said, okay, I will tell you my dream. And even worse is that uh, he wanted us to reveal any wet dream we may have. I didn't have any. I had, but I forgot. I just said I didn't have. But he was a very funny guy. But uh, I was so surprised. Uh, almost uh, 12 years ago, he came to China uh, with uh, Yukun, and I asked him what he was doing. He said, I'm teaching positive psychology. I said, what is it? And he said, positive psychology. He actually gave me a book. He wrote the first textbook in positive psychology, the premiere of positive psychology. And he, before he passed away, he passed away a couple of years ago, he left this uh, very interesting book, Pursuing the Good Life, 100 Reflection on Positive Psychology, in which he talked about uh, what is uh, positive psychology. Positive psychology, in a nutshell, is the scientific study that try to make people's life worth living. Very simple. It's actually a scientific guidebook, a roadmap to help people to live a good life. So what's good life? He argued, it's not about the money, it's not very much about your social status, uh, to a certain degree, it's not necessarily about your longevity. And what is a good life? He argued, it's actually the life full of love. If you don't love anybody, if you're never loved by anybody, the life is not worth living. So love is very important. Number two, playful. The life is a playful. It's not hard work. We live not necessarily to do the job. Actually, the reason we do the job is to have a better life. We often forgot the causal effect relationship. So we live here is not to do the job. We live here is actually to enjoy good life. Of course, study working hard. The whole purpose of it is to make your life worth living. Number three, service, meaning that uh, make yourself available, useful, meaningful to other people. So life is not very much about the individual, you. It's actually about other people, for people like you guys, very smart, very intelligent, with a great education from Tsinghua University, and your life definitely going to be worthwhile. But you need to have a higher purpose. The purpose is to make other people's life worthwhile, because it's very easy for intelligent people to have their own life worth living. But what is more important is to make other people surrounding you, other, pe other people love you, other people like you, and that other people work for you, make their life better life. Of course, what is good life? Life with a purpose, life with a meaning. Sometimes when we think about the purpose and meaning, we come up with a great grand steel, the purposes. Some people even to elevate to the status of religious faith or the political purposes. I think the meaning is very simple. It's the psychological abilities. You can find the meanings in daily life. You look at waters, you f realize there's a meaning in there. You look at the cloud, you figure there's a meaning in there. I think if you can do that, then you live a life full of meanings. So that's the ability of a human brain. So Professor Christopher Peterson believed that uh, Positive psychology is actually try to help people to enjoy, to have love, play, service, and a sense of meaning. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what a positive psychology is, is to help people make life worth living. So very simple. So how to be positive? Uh, for this uh, whole semester, Dr. Zhao Yukun and myself will teach scientific studies on the field of positive psychology. So there will be lots of uh, methodologies, lots of uh, suggestions, tips, but I want to give you a foundational explanations how to be positive, 
how to be positive, doing what humans can do better. Very simple. That's my theory. So how to be positive? Actually, use the human strengths, use the unique human abilities. So philosopher Wang Yangmin actually has this uh, very, very wise suggestions. He said, follow your conscience, practice what you know, and your heart will be content. I don't know necessarily this a correct translation, but it's not my translation nevertheless. So the whole idea is that uh, if we can follow the human natures, our conscience, then we practice the knowledge, particularly the wise, better knowledge we have, we will actually feel content, feel be very happy. Then what is the human natures? Philosophers, they have their own arguments, writers, artists, and different fields, people from different fields, they all have their own explanations, their own suggestions, definition about the human natures. Psychology is a discipline based on evolutions. So that's a consensus in the field. So Charles Darwin's evolution theory is the theoretical foundation of psychology, therefore is also the foundation of a positive psychology. The argument is like this. All the human man, mental and the psychological traits, uh, including animals' traits, we're not going to talk about it tonight, we only talk about the human psychological traits, such as memory, perceptions, language, and the positive mindset we're talking about tonight, actually are evolved adaptations. What that means is that uh, during the long process of uh, human evolution, those psychological traits can benefit human survival can benefit human reproduction will be selected in. So that's called the uh, adaption because it's been selected, because it's been helpful to all human species. So the resulting psychological mechanisms benefit human survival and the human reproductions. So he actually wrote two books to explain this evolutionary mechanisms. One is a book everybody know in this classroom, origin, The Origins of a Species talking about the natural selection process, the survival of the fittest. Some people, when they explain the fittest, they explain that as a phys physical strength, the fit. When we say someone for the fit, meaning that uh, the person has this uh, wonderful physical build up, right? the muscles strong, the bones strong, and even good looking, right? So that's uh, people's explanations. But actually, in Darwin's idea, the fittest, meaning that uh, you're well adapted to the changing environments. So natural selection, select, not the strongest. The dinosaur is very strong, but he disappeared much earlier than human being. So it's not about survival of strongest. It's about the survival of the fittest. So humans are incredibly well adapted to the changing environment. So those, those resulting psychological traits are traits that help us to survive. Second mechanism, Darwin also talked about the, the descent of a man and the selection, uh, descent of a man, and talking about the uh, sexual selections. Very interestingly is that uh, very few people in China actually read this book. There, was, there is a Chinese translation of the book, but nobody read it because uh, it, will, it involves this uh, very interesting concept called the sex. We Chinese do, do it, but we don't talk about it. So actually, this natural selections talk about the second selective mechanism. The mechanism is not about the survival, it's about the reproductions. The peacock always displays the f beautiful feather. He has uh, no surviving advantage. He doesn't have a surviving advantage because uh, the predators can notice you right there from distance and uh, charge to eat you, right? So also you, you were displaying, you were enjoying the displaying of the feather and you just couldn't pay attention to other predators. You couldn't run very fast, very well. So he has no so-called natural selection advantage. But why the peacock, particularly the male peacock, always display the beautiful weather? Because it has natural selection advantage. Because it, the beautiful your feather, the more attractive you are. Therefore, the opposite sex 
very likely to have a mate with you, to have an offspring, to have a new gene spread out. So you can see it's the selection of the beautiful, it's the survival of the beautiful, not survival of the fittest. Very interesting. The reason I talk about is that is because we can re-examine human evolutions to discover what is a unique human nature. You may be surprised. All the unique human natures are the result of a natural selection and sexual selection. It benefits our survival, also benefits our reproduction. So if you can identify something that is absolutely unique to human species, then you may be surprised those are the human natures. Many times, people mix up with the human instinct and the animal instincts. We humans actually are animals. We are noble savage. So we have an animal instinct as well because we are animals. Everybody don't forget about that. So we have all this wild instinct just like animals. We are greedy. We are hateful. Right? We try to kill others. We do have those animal instincts. But it's very odd. We beat those animals is not because our animal instincts is stronger than those animals. Just to think about it, we can run faster than those animals. They run much faster than us. Our strength is not as strong as those wild animals. So it's not that the animal instincts that made us to beat other animals is actually something unique human instincts that make us stronger than those animals. So nowadays, we are beat almost any animals, according to some expression. Uh, we Chinese can eat everything, right? Uh, that, that's a joke. We don't eat a lot of stuff. We, have, we do have a cultural taboo as well. But what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, we can beat those animals. At least we can put them in the wild animal zoo to enjoy those wild animals. Not those wild animals put all human in the wild human zoo, right? So you can see, so we have the strengths that's called the human instincts. So what are those human instincts? We positive psychology argue that uh, most of the human instinct is surprisingly uh, possible human psychological traits. So those traits unique to human beings. Uh, if we utilize those unique human natures, we actually can feel uplifting, feel wonderful, feel good. Let's give you a couple examples. You will notice that. So we human has this uh, very, very big brain. Not necessarily the head is big. It's the something inside that is uh, very big. So those uh, big human, we call the cortex, particularly the neocortex, the new cortex we have. And it's much bigger than animals. And those neocortex are actually functions of a human alone. So we have a uh, wisdom. Animals didn't have, don't have. We have um, rich emotional systems. So having emotion is actually human unique traits. We also have the language abilities. So talking, speaking make us very happy. So you can see those professors like to talk a lot. Even at the time, you have to go off the class, but they still talking, right? Because it makes them very happy. Because that's the human nature. And there are other characteristics that make us very unique, and we find that uh, utilizing those unique human abilities can actually make us feel better, feel good. So let's summarize briefly. So human evolution started 60 million to 300,000 years ago, resulting in a different unique human build-up, like a vertical posture, and then parents for women, also the bare skin, we lost lots of hairs, and also disproportionately large brain. And all this uh, physiological change due to the long evolution process, we humans evolved some positive human traits that uh, so far we find very special, very unique to humans. Rationality is something we humans have. So having reason, have a rational mindset, somehow we find can help us to deal with uh, problems. And the uh, empathy, we have the sense to understand other people's feelings, desires, wishes, and uh, intentions. And that's a very powerful ability human have. 
Research have found that two and a half years old baby can understand the parents' psychological states like anxious or depressed, and that's a very unique human behaviors. No other species the baby can do that. No artificial intelligence can do that either. We have self-control. We're not indulging ourselves all the time. We have a morality, sense of right and wrong. We have a reason. We have learned. We can create. So you can see we have uh, imaginations. We have a unique ability to plan for the future. Very interesting. Even we are idle, we find that the psychologists find that the people still engaging in uh, processing, imagining futures. So we also have this concrete thinking. Uh, we also have the abilities to be sensitive, caring, kind, cooperation. It's very important of human traits because by single individuals, we cannot fight any wild animals, but by working in a group, cooperating with each other, we can beat any species. So that's unique human traits. Uh, that's somebody even claimed. That's another evolutionary selection mechanism. It's called the corporations, inclusive fitness. And we have this uh, aesthetic abilities. We can enjoy beauty. We can enjoy wonderful, beautiful things. We have responsibility. We can communicate, etc. So you can see all these uh, human traits are actually positive psychological traits we human have. So in order to make us feel happy, we find that uh, utilizing psychological strengths is actually utilizing unique human characteristics, human traits. So I'll give you a couple examples. We'll give you a couple hints and tips. This is a study done by Professor Gary Sherman, uh, used to be a professor at Berkeley, my colleagues. In 1997, he discovered, he proposed this very interesting idea. So there is a very, very old human nerve. Newman nerve is called a vagus nerve. It's a quantum nerve. Uh, this nerve is the uh, oldest, it's the longest human nerve. And before we think this nerve is only responsible for this uh, parasomatic control of the heart, lung, and the digestive functions. Now, he proposed this nerve may be associated with uh, human instincts, like a pro-social behavior, like a morality, or human happiness. Why? Because this nerve is the oldest one. So when human will walk with four legs, with four legs, this nerve is already there, but this, the existence is only twisted. So just know your head, you feel that the twist in your, in your body. But when we standing up as a human being, walking with two legs, this vagus nerve starts to open up. So this is why Whenever we see some beautiful pictures, beautiful woman or man, we have this urge to open our vagus nerve, raise our head, open our chest, and the screaming, wow, bravo, wonderful, right? Or in Chinese, how? Nobody stressed the vagus nerve, twisted to, to scream, how? It's very difficult to do that. Instead, if we see something that is uh, ugly, that's immoral, that's not good, then we will do the opposite. We will s s your stress our vagus nerve. So we will have C, E, G, or Ayo. When you feel something bad, you will scream Ayo, right? Nobody say Ayo, it's Ayo, right? We can feel that uh, when you suppress your vagus nerve or you open your vagus nerve, you have totally different uh, psychological response. Let's do the exercise together with me, okay? Everybody, raise your head, your proud head, raise your head. Open your chest and doing something together with me. Also, for those people online, you can do that even better while right? you're pretty much at home. So, basically, when you say how, you just uh, stress you on and you say how. Let's do it together. How? how? Wow. 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 Great. Great. You feel good, right? Okay, let's do the opposite. Put your hands uh, cross over on your shoulder. Lower your head. The lower, the better. Then you try to scream. Wow, good, great. Very difficult, right? Almost impossible, right? So Gary Sherman believed that because when you 
open your chest and you raise your head, uh, you pretty much feel the feeling of being humans. When you suppress that, you remind you the miserable time with human walking on four legs, right? So that is why all these wonderful things, great things, this religious icon and those, uh, you know, like this uh, people's uh, hero monuments, they all have to build very high and the tall because it will raise you, open your weak nerve. So p- philosopher Emil Kant actually made this uh, very interesting observations uh, almost uh, 200 years ago. He said, two things fill the mind with the every new and the increasing admiration and the awe. The more often and steadily we reflect upon them, the starry heavens, the sky, starry sky above me, and the moral law within me. So whenever you look up with the starry sky, you feel the sense of being moral, and that sense of being moral, we already know, has a unique human nature. That's precisely what the Wang Yangming said, Liang Zi. So he said that Liang Zi is morality, and whenever we feel the sense of morality, it's actually the time we feel ourselves being human. So that's the theoretical foundation of positive psychology. Evolution select the positive traits that are unique, the human beings. If we utilize those unique human abilities, we actually could, could have a positive experience at the moment. So that is why we look at the sky, we look at anything that is vast, anything that is great, anything beyond our human comprehensions. So we have this sense of a diminishing self. We're small. The heaven, the nature, the God, the everything that is above us tend to be much greater. And we have a sense of reflections, reflection on our life, reflection on our behavior, reflection on things that we did. We also have a sense of a sheer humanity, right? As the bright moon shines over the sea from far away, you share this moment with me. So that's the Chinese Tang poet, a point. Can actually show that when we look at the sky, open our vagus nerve, we have the sense of being humans, like a movie, Shawshank Redemption. Have you seen the movie before, anybody? Have you seen How many people have seen the movie before? Raise your hands. Okay. So there was a very famous scene in the movie, Andy, the character, right? Uh, he get out, he get out of the prison. So in this uh, sandstorm, what kind of uh, actions he did? What he did when, you, when he fir- first get out of uh, the prison? Anybody remember? Raise the head, why right? look the up and open the arm. Actually, is to open the vagus nerve. So that is the psychological foundation theory of positive psychology. So, how to be happy? Uh, we have a couple, uh, 10 minutes, I will go very fast about the how to be happy, then have a 10 minutes uh, uh, Q&A. How to be happy? Well, my suggestion is very simple, is uh, actually uh, do three things. Number one, try to control your negative uh, emotional activity, not necessarily by direct control, we talk about that, it's not very easy to do that, but actually try to suppress, try to mitigate of your negative response. So there's a one physiological uh, action we should uh, take, is to suppress amygdala's activities, because we find that, that whenever people feel distressed, feel unhappy, the amygdala try to uh, actually very active, aroused, so make people unhappy. So one thing we could do is try to suppressed amygdala's activities. How to be happy? You cannot simply make this uh, negative emotional experience absent. You have to try to generate uh, so-called uh, positive uh, neurotransmitters. There are at least uh, three very important neurotransmitters. If we can make those transmitters release, we can feel happy. That's about the dopamine, oxytocin, various uh, peptides, uh, and uh, serotonin, those are very important ones. And how to do that, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, Yukun will give in detail about those techniques, those research, about uh, how to generate those uh, very useful, very powerful, very positive neurotransmitters. 
But besides those two, we humans have another very important task in order to feel good and wonderful. That is uh, utilizing your brain powers because we human, unlike uh, animals, we have to give uh, meanings to any physiological reactions. So by simply generating those uh, physiological reactions are not good enough. We should give a sense for meanings, sense for purposes. So those are the meaning purposes actually make our life worth living. In the meantime, make our experience very positive. So, so what are they? Dopamines we know now is a reward uh, chemicals. Sometimes we finish something, we feel wonderful. At that moment, I strongly encourage you to enjoy the moment, taste, suffering your success. Many teachers, many parents don't know about that. So when the kids finish their homework, then the teachers and the parents rush to the kids, force them to do another one, and uh, take away the happiness, the pleasures of the kids. My experience at the moment, in doing that, you take away the internal drive to enjoy studying and learning because you take away the dopamine release. So anything that makes us feel good, we should taste it, we should experience that, we should savor in that experience. That's called the dopamine release. And uh, this is a type of doing self-care activity. We find that uh, enjoying taking care of yourself, washing your face, and uh, also doing makeup on your face, make you feel good. Enjoy the moment. Forget of people's criticism. You know, some people don't like people dress up. Actually, if dressing up, enjoy and make yourself happy. Do that. Forget about that. Because uh, that's going to help you to release dopamines. Eating food, that is why students like all the food, because uh, food, eat, you know, uh, generate a lot of dopamine. It's very important. So anything you like to do, enjoy doing that. Celebrate little wins. So anything that will make yourself believe that uh, you have done something great, enjoy the victories. Uh, oxytocin, uh, that's what they call the loving hormones. So play with the dog, play with the baby, holding hands, hugging your family members, give compliments. All those things we find that, that make you feel wonderful. So you, you can hug your friends. Maybe after classroom, after this class, we all hug wonderful friends. And definitely you make you instantly happy at the moment because uh, oxytocin is actually that uh, useful hormone, make people feel good. And uh, serotonin, um, Professor Michael Houghton won Nobel Prize last year. He, he was a Canadian, was actually a psychologist as well. And the reason he got Nobel Prize is because he found a vaccine. Uh, but actually, his uh, true success was the discover of this uh, serotonin, because the serotonin can stabilize your mood a mood when you feel down, when you feel unhappy, the serotonin release can help you. So mediating, uh, meditation, you know, running, sun exposure, you know, like uh, taking sun baths can help people release serotonin. Walking in nature, swimming, uh, cycling, all these actions, we find that uh, increase people's uh, serotonin release. So it's very important that when you feel unhappy, perhaps is that uh, you don't have enough serotonin. So you can see the present inmate, they feel horrible when they stay inside, but they feel wonderful when they get out, right? When they get out, they're not necessarily released, but they get out in this uh, courtyard of the prison, meaning Fang Feng, but they feel very happy at the moment because it has the serotonin release. So find those things definitely help you. And uh, endorphin, that's uh, one of those uh, so-called uh, uh, peptides, and that's actually the painkiller. So when you're doing exercise, you feel very painful, and you just cannot do it anymore, and you force yourself to continue for another two or three minutes, then your brain will release this painkiller, help you to feel good. That's why people, after exercise, they all feel wonderful, uplifting. And uh, also, watching comedies, because uh, when your brain cell, comedy is actually requires a certain level of intelligence. So comedy is actually burning your brain cell, that will release your painkiller, that's uh, out of it. And eating dark chocolate is uh, very bit, but if you endure, you feel, wow, it's actually not that bad, right? So exercising is another very good way to release your um, so endorphins. 
Anyway, there are lots of uh, useful tips, useful suggestions that can help you to, uh, to release those uh, happy uh, neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters will actually help you to improve your mood and improve your emotional experience in order to improve your well-being. Then I give you last tip that will finish this class. This tip actually exercise we did in the very beginning of the class. In 1862, a French physician did a very interesting psychological research. I would consider this as a, one of the first positive psychology experiments. Nobody agree with me, but I would like to consider that's the case. So he get his labor to his laboratory, then hooked the facial muscles with those electronic uh, machine, and he identified various kind of facial expressions with various kind of muscle combination. He discovered three muscle combinations generate the most contagious facial expression. That's what we call the Dishang smile. The three muscle uh, uh, refers to this uh, muscle in your mouth collar and the muscle in your cheek and the muscle at your eye collar. When you see your uh, three muscles on your face display this uh, expressions and the expressions can actually make yourself and make other people smiling and that smiling we find is actually beneficial sometimes we fake our smile like this girl is faking the smile because uh, we can only control the muscle the face muscle at our mouth color and also checks we actually cannot control the muscle at the eye corner when we only feel authentic happiness then we have this uh, wrinkles. If we don't, and we cannot display. So this girl didn't have this wrinkle here, and the eyebrows rise, meaning that she is faking smile. So now, give you a test. Uh, this is Professor Paul Ackerman, uh, my old colleague and the friends. And he gave us two smiling faces. Which one is authentic? Which one is fake? Well, let's give you an EQ test now. This is a Authentic, right? Yeah. This is a fake because you check there's a tiny differences and there's uh, wrinkles right there. Uh, this is a uh, movie star Julie Roberts by right? Oscar winner. So she gave us uh, two smiling faces. Which one is uh, authentic? Another one, right? Yeah. This is a uh, very popular uh, kids online. <laughs> it's called the professional <laughs> fake smiler, right? Yeah. So he always a fake smile because you can see there's no eye wrinkle right there. And uh, unlike those two, they, they were smiling. So uh, this is the last slide. Uh, basically, if you really want to know you are happy or not, uh, you can uh, take uh, you, a snapshot of your face, answer three questions. The question number one, do you see any uh, mouth corner rise and check muscle rise or eye wrinkle right there if you had all three? Congratulations, at least you feel happy at the moment. Okay, well, that's all I want to talk about tonight. Uh, West material will be uh, told by uh, Dr. Zhao Yukun, and you will see uh, lots of uh, interesting scientific discoveries from psychology. Of course, debates as well, because I don't want to say all these uh, scientific discoveries are fixed, absolutely true. Uh, everything in psychology are subjects for debate, and so therefore, lots of uh, interesting uh, discovers lots of interesting arguments, but uh, I think it will make yourself open your minds and uh, experience better life. Thank you. Have a good night. Take care. <laughs>